Hello, everybody. I'm going to wait till 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We're about a minute away. So hopefully we see everybody here. Okay. We're almost there. Okay, let's see. Who do we have? Hey, Denny, how are you? I get to talk to most, say hello to most of the people in the beginning. Robert, hey, uh, I can't read that one. I, I'm okay. Greg, I I think it's Samir. Uh, Dwayne, hello. Prince, hello. Okay, uh, it's almost six o'clock. Hey, Denny, hello again. Hey, Jenny, how are you? Okay, let's see. Uh, a lot of people are coming online now. Good at six o'clock. Okay. Hey, Alexis, how are you? Uh, Tim, Joey. Okay, this lesson today is is pretty cool. Uh, you know, you would think of, you know, Mr. Shred as not thinking much about anything but shredding, but it's not true. I mean, I, you know, I, I've said this before, but musical people figure out a way to make music. It's that simple. Uh, and I'm no different from anybody else uh, when it comes to that. Uh, you know, I have a musical mind and I use my technique to make music. But one of the things that I worked very hard on, and it's one of the most integral parts of playing, is my vibrato and bending to a vibrato. Now, it's a very, let's see who else is on here. Bill, Jeff, God, there's a lot of people. Uh, Kelly, cool. We're, we're getting a lot of people coming in now, which is great. I really appreciate uh, all the support that I've had on on these uh, lessons. You know, I, I think that it's not a bad thing to give back. And, and you know, I, I try to give back in ways that I feel that I can be a most effective, like uh, donating to... Uh, the Humane Society. <laughs> so, and uh, I mean, I love dogs and animals, so you know, I donate money to that, but to help other guitar players. Uh, I, I really love that. Let's see who else. Okay, now I'm gonna start talking about the lesson first. And I, I there are so many questions that come in each week that you know I get sidetracked a little bit, but uh, hopefully that I stay on topic enough for you to get something out of this. Now, I've got my guitar pointed a little bit like this, just because of the way the camera is. It's more panoramic, you know, more uh, horizontal than vertical. And so one of the things about vibrato, I don't care. When I play guitar normally, and I play lead guitar, my positioning is very much like a classical guitarist. Like you notice my thumb's not over the neck. Uh, it's a very natural hand motion when I play. So you don't want, you don't want to overcompensate by playing like this. Ah! I mean, walk down the street like this. Hello. How you doing today? I feel pretty good. So you don't want to walk like, you don't want to walk down a street like this. Why do you want to play guitar like that? That's the equivalent of playing like this. But you don't want to overcompensate either. You look like a darn duck. Hello. I'm Romberg Rabbit the Third. And so, or what is that, Garfield Goose? Uh, but you don't want to do that. And so, okay, what happened here? Okay, now, um, so what you try to do is when you're playing guitar, you want to have as close to a position of your hands down by your side as possible. In other words, if you're walking down the street like this, you don't want it like this, you don't want it like that. So, but if you play with your thumb behind the neck, and a lot of times uh, you can angle your guitar upward like this, and, and uh, it works really good. Now here's what I learned about vibrato and bending. You have to do it old school. And what I mean by that is this, uh, take in rock and metal, uh, who's got one of the best best vibratos and most well-known, Ingve Malmsteen. Well, what does he do when he plays? He Do you hear that? That's a clean sound. Of See, what I do is I put my thumb proudly over the neck. Hello. And so I put my thumb proudly over the neck like a blues guitar player. And you shake that baby. You shake it mean. And so it's kind of like the outlaw Josie Wales. You got to get plum mean. And so you want to get mean when it comes to sh Like even. And so when you play. When I play, you sh I shake it 
hard. And so in other words... Now there's another thing that I do. There's two parts to this, the vibrato and the bend into the vibrato. Okay, so one of the things that's most important is to be able to physically shake the your fingers and you have to do it hard. One of the things that I think the the social media uh, generation ha has really established is that I, you know, in my entire life until we had social media, and especially Instagram, we have a minute to show what you can do. Um, I never really watched the picking hands of people other than my favorite players. I mean, I made a study of picking, but I only watched... I watched what I considered the best of the year, the Al Miolas, the John McLaughlins, the George Bensons. Uh, you know, I, the list goes on and on. Really great players that I studied from and I gave you information from in my uh, instructional programs. But now I'll watch every, everybody. It doesn't matter if you're famous, not so famous. Uh, I watch the way they play because I can, because we can. And so it, it has been a quantum leap and the way that guitar players play. Now watch, when you vibrato, you might be playing like this. So you might be shredding out, and I have a totally clean sound too. So. But when you're playing, and you're playing like this, and you break into to a vibrato. Put your thumb over the neck and shake that bad boy. And then you want to get your blues face. So that's <laughs> mandatory. No, it's not mandatory. That is an optional thing to do. Uh, you know, it's a funny thing. When I play guitar, if you watch the original Speed Kills uh, program, me playing No Boundaries with the Gold's Gym shirt and the, the massive arms, of course. And uh, anyway... I tried not to make faces. I would literally be like. Instead of going, I would go. And so people said, oh, my clients would be, he's got no feeling, man. He goes, like, look at his face, bro. Like, his face ain't moving, man. Like, he's like. And so I wasn't, I was, I tried purpose because I thought it was stupid. Like having a wah pedal. I thought that was a ridiculous thing to do. So all of a sudden, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and every guitar player in the world's like. And then people are going, oh my God, he's got such feeling like, like Penelope. Can't you understand the emotion in his face that translates to the notes played on the guitar? I'm like, are you out of your mind? All the guy persons do is like, and so here's what I did. I did a video like that. I was like, And people are like, dude, what's wrong with his face, man? And I'm like, hey, I look cool. And so I, you know, you can't win. You, you either are expressionless and you have no feeling or you put, he has too much feeling in his face. And so all I can tell you is this, the faces are up to you. But when it comes to the first thing you want to work on is just take your first finger and vibrato it. But you see, it's shaking it. I shake it hard, man. And that's the thing that the internet and especially social media has changed. Because when I first started touring and I had opening acts, the majority of the opening bands in all the countries I went to, including the United States, the opening bands played wimpy. The drummer was like, and the guitar players are very tentative. They played soft. A lot of the girls I used to see uh, in bands played soft. Uh, and so it was something that they didn't understand how the pros were aggressive. And so, and that's something that I used to see all the time. I could watch a drummer in, in five seconds. I don't want to hit too hard because if I hit too hard, well, like, 
I just had hit it too hard. And so I used to see this in a really light and dainty. And, and I thought, well, that's not pro. But now a lot of the young musicians, I, they, they watch up close the professionals like myself, uh, you know, anybody you can imagine from Michael Shanker uh, to Andy James, you know, to it doesn't matter, but you get to see people up close. And whether you're a guy or a girl, it's like how many women are in symphony orchestras. Why is that? Because they taught the same way to men and women for centuries. But with electric guitar, be, being that it's such a new instrument, a lot of women didn't really get, quote, training on it like they would have if it would have been 200 years ago. Um, and so the reason I'm saying is this is you play hard. Just practice a vibrato. It can be, I like to do on the third string, you can do it on the, on the fifth fret, seventh fret, 10th fret, 12th fret. But to hear how it goes, now I, I can go, or I could go, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about the facial expressions. Close your eyes. What does it sound like? And so when you start a vibrato, you shake it up and down. Now, here's the beauty of this. I call it fretboard hand muting. Now, yes, I have one of my Chromacast string dampeners on, but even if I take it off, it doesn't matter. This just helps the shreddy stuff. And so when you play, you practice. See, here's here's your tonal center here. And when you vibrato, see how it lays around that tonal center? It goes sharp, it goes, and it goes a little flat, uh, but but mostly sharp because you're really bending it. So, but you know, I bet you if you if you put it on a strobe tuner and slowed it down, the string would go flat a tiny bit. But what you try to do is shake the string. And that is, and you have to use your thumb, put it over the neck and be proud. Now here's a really cool thing. Fretboard hand muting. Here is my finger, first finger, seventh fret, third string. Now here, what am I doing? You hear that? My first finger is blocking the string below it and the two strings above it. This is fretboard hand muting. And if you just vibrato, see, watch, watch this up close. Now watch, look where my hand is. Fourth string, second string. Hey, cousin Bill, how are you? He just joined in. Uh, I wanna say hello to a couple other people. I actually wrote it down. I said hello to Denny. I said hello to Alexis. We'll say hello to those two again. Uh, Nick, a really great friend. Brett, a really good friend. Ben and Tanya. And uh, Denny, of course, I've acknowledged you a couple times. Uh, really good friend. What a guitar collection. Between the two of us, we have a monster collection. Each of us has a monster collection of guitars. Now, getting back to this vibrato, it is so important because when you like... It's so expressive to end on a nice vibrato. And what you do is when you do it like this, you try to use, you not try, you do. You use your first finger to block the notes above it and the one note below it. Now I'm close to a harmonic, so that's what, now watch. But here's what happens with your, with your picking hand, you can hold it down a little bit. See my picking hand, I'm using my thumb to block other strings. These are nuances the, that you can do and it will be second nature once you practice this. But the vibrato is one of the most important tools in music because it's kind of like a landing. Um, when, like if you have watched gymnasts, you know, like, like doing that, that, they call it the horse. I used to do that in high school, gymnastics. But when somebody does a flip and they land really accurately, and they nail the landing. That's really, you can like be spastic up in the air, but if you nail the landing, um, that is one of the things that, that people look at and say, man, that is, that's right. That's like, I get it.
Um, now watch, here's where, where I do a vibrato with my third finger, because the primary fingers you're going to use for vibrato are your first and third. Now that doesn't say you're not gonna use your second or you're not gonna use your fourth. I mean, I use both a lot, but the primary ones, the ones you'll find probably you use more. First, now look at my third finger. I am on the ninth fret, fourth string, third finger. Now, what is my first finger doing? Fretboard hand muting. And see, all you have to do is control your fingers a little. So you don't want to be like this. First of all, you can't control it and your other fingers are spastic. See, when I play like that, see, I use my first finger to say, strings, you ain't gonna sound today. Maybe tomorrow, maybe yesterday, but not today. And so the idea is very simple. You use fretboard hand muting to help yourself only play the note that you want to play, and especially in a vibrato, because the last thing you want to do is go. I've got my string gapping around, so look at that. You hardly hear anything. That's why string dampeners are so good. But let's take it without it. Pretty huge difference, isn't it? Just come up with some weird song. But anyway, when I put this bad boy down, but do you hear? I'm, it has a feel to it. Now, one of the things you don't want to do with the vibrato is you want to go too fast. Because you saw like, no, no. I've had a lot of sugar and caffeine today. Starbucks, 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 Starbucks. It's like people will be like, oh, what was that? You know, it makes people nervous. And so you want to, just a nice, pleasing vibrato. But you practice it. You single this out, put your thumb over the neck, and shake it. You shake, you know, it's like this, shake me! You know, it's like the Cinderella song. I love that song. But um, what you do is you practice just the vibrato. You practice fretboard hand muting. And remember, this is a nuance. So it doesn't matter if you bend your thumb. We are not trying to shred, quote, unquote. We are trying to make an expressive vibrato. Watching Van Malmsteen. Just watch it. He's a textbook on what I've just talked about. I'm a textbook about what we just talked, what I just talked about, what we, well, that's because I'm a Gemini. Hello. This is little Joey. Hello. If you don't, I used to say in workshops, I said, this is Joey. Hello. He's from Chicago. Chicago. And I used to say, okay, if anybody in the audience has questions, great. And then nobody would say it. And I go, if you don't, Joey can ask questions, hello, and we will have a constructive dialogue tonight. So I was like, Joey. <laughs> so anyway, and he's got a Chicago kind of accent, like Chicago. We don't, we don't say Chicago or like California, $10 to go to the concert, dot com. We say dot com, God, G-A-H-D, God. So, I mean, when you watch the Blues Brothers, it's a very accurate depiction of the Chicago uh, American accent. And so anyway, now getting back to my vibratos, you really have to single it out, practice it, uh, whether you use a fret mute, uh, fret, you know, that, that those fret mute things, fret dampeners, whatever they call, um, I, fret wraps. Um, I love this string dampener because you can just flip it up and down. They're bad. I, and, you know, I do have a patent on it, but it works so good. Uh, you know, I, I, I've started to use it all the time, even without my double guitar. And now, when you bend, this is the next part of it. You have to work on this individually. <laughs> And, and see, a lot of times, like, uh, if only Jeff Tate and, and I think uh, Bruce Dickinson were two of the singers that got away with a very heavy vocal vibrato, like, you know, Queen of the Rock, but it was an octave higher. Could I believe? Um, to me, that's more operatic, and it's not very pleasing to my ear, unless you're singing a... Uh, 
the marriage of Figaro or, or you know, uh, Rigoletto by Haydn. Um, and so, uh, you know, operas. And, and so, but those two singers were, were very commercial in that. So when you hear pop music, like, for example, Ozzy Osbourne, he very rarely vibratos. Pop music doesn't have a heavy vibrato. I mean, listen all the way from the Beatles to now pop music. Listen to Britney Spears. How about, I want it that way. Tell me why. You don't hear this. Tell me why. <laughs> you know, it's like Queen of the Rye. You don't hear that because it's not a very pleasing sound to a majority of people that like to listen to, quote, more commercial type. So the commercial singers don't add that. And, and so the reason why I'm saying this, I'm not doing a sidebar to the vibrato. You don't want a vibrato. <laughs> It just sounds forced and it sounds unnatural and it's not pleasing to the ear for many people. I, but again, it's not that I don't like that. It's just, it always reminded me of when I studied opera. When you are listening to a great opera singer, you expect that. That's part of the music. So without that, it's, it's a sign that they don't have that control over their voice like a great singer should be. But in modern music and pop music, and this goes back m many decades now, I mean, you can look at Frank Sinatra, Elvis, they don't have those super heavy vibratos. So think about that when you're vibratoing, because you want to... So you want to have a really good, pleasing vibrato, but you have to work it. You have to practice one finger, second finger, third finger. Now, I am left-handed, so I vibrato a lot with my fourth. And here's the second part of this, a bend to a vibrato. See, what you want to do is you, if I'm in the key of E, just a blue scale, if I'm in the key of E and I bend D, to E. So you want to bend up and then shake the note. You don't shake it before, you don't go. <laughs> it sounds like, you know. A... They're taking over the world. It's the Martians. It's not like that. I'm getting crazy, but it's true. It's not like that. You. You bend, starting with a solid note without going nee, nee, nee. You start it, bend upwards, vibrato. So it's the initial attack, the bend, the vibrato. The attack of the note, no vibrato, bend, vibrato. And what you want to do is you can even uh, do things like, say, record a MIDI note on an E. Just goofing around, uh, but you can do that's a classic rock song. But and see, you want and I use my fourth finger to bend, but a lot of people use their third. But um, I'm left handed, my fourth finger is extremely strong, and I use it a lot. Uh, a lot of people that would use their third finger, I would use my fourth. Why? Because I can, and so, um, when I Now, I'm playing what's called the M24. This is one of my new signature guitars from Sawtooth. And I'm playing through a, a little Sawtooth 25 watt amp with the coolest reverb I've ever heard. Listen to this reverb. It's like a slap back echo. Slap back echo. And so, I, I love this little lamp, and I wanted to use a clean sound to illustrate to you that you don't need excessive overdrive to accomplish what you need to do. But, but if you work on your vibrato, if you work on the initial vibrato, then the bend and vibrato, not only will you become a better player, but people will, per will perceive you as 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 a better player because they hear the emotion with it and especially if you're in time 
and, and you land on that note and you vibrato it. It's really an important part of your playing. So I hope this makes sense. Now, before we move on, I want to say something. I've been very active on YouTube. And I also, uh, I have been with Metal Method uh, for really the 80s. Uh, you know, it, well, it was the late 80s when Doug and I became really good friends. And and from my first Speed Kills program, I've never gone to another company. Uh, I've been very loyal to him because we're, we're like family. But all my instructional programs are available at metalmethod.com. And I'm telling you, they're great. They are really great. If you want incredible details about what I'm talking about, whether it's a vibrato, whether, whether it's sweep picking, whether it's economy picking, alternate picking, hybrid picking, arpeggios, you name it, they are in. I mean, I've literally got 13 instructional programs. And so on, on my YouTube channel, Michelangelo Video Official, we have gotten permission from Metal Method to post parts of these programs. So for example, I, I did, we have a Speed Kills series and a Speed Lives. Speed Lives is my, are my songs. So I actually broke my song, No Boundaries, because so many people want to learn it, into 27 different sections. Well, what we did is we posted the first part of Speed Kills, uh, uh, the, the series, so you could see it. And it's on my YouTube page. We are posting a lot of content on there. In fact, this video... Uh, this lesson tonight will not only be on Facebook, but it will be on my YouTube channel. So you really should check it out. Michelangelo Badio Official. Uh, and we have a lot of content coming. You see brand new playthroughs. And we're going to be showing a lot of, of my career as well. This is the M24 in satin white. It's a flat white. Um, this guitar lists for in the $400. Now, people said last week or two weeks ago, no, it doesn't. It lists for like six ninety nine, man. You're like up in the price, man. And that's not true. What was happening is is that people were posting links to what's called an upgrade. And so, if you buy the four hundred dollar version of this guitar, let me tell you what you get. We use Wilkinson. If anybody knows Trevor Wilkinson, he makes great tremolos up from from England, and, and he makes great tuners. Uh, and so, we use Wilkinson tuners. And you get a top-of-the-line German-made Floyd Rose on the $400 model. If you upgrade to the $699, then they redo the wiring, and they add Duncan pickups, and they really trick it out. So from top to bottom, you get an upgrade. So you're basically playing the equivalent of a USA-made guitar for $600 hundred and something dollars, six ninety nine, And so that, uh, but we are, we are going to be shipping these in the summer. Uh, you can pre-order them now. And, and uh, but I mean, it's a fantastic guitar. And what I did is I have the upgrade on my guitar. Now I'm going to switch guitars and talk about a couple other things too, but I hope you got something out of this uh, vibrato and, and bending technique. And I'll go over it again uh, before the hour's up. I'm going to switch guitars. Okay, Michael has left the building for a second. Okay, now I'm playing one of my other signatures, and this is called the M24 in satin black. I love this guitar. It's really cool. The back is totally cool. Uh, the front with, I, I just, and flat black. Um, you know, I wear all black, so my wardrobe, I never have to think about a color choice anymore. It's like, what should I wear? This black one or that black one? And so everything in my closet is black, literally. And, and so I, I never have to think about that stuff. You know, it's kind of like uh, the owner of, uh, and uh, the founder of Facebook, you know, he does the same thing. He's got all basically the same clothes. Why? Because we're dudes. That's the way we think. And so, but with this guitar, this is in the $250 price range. And then we have a lot more signature guitars coming out. But I want to show it. This is with the clean Santa. I mean, I love the sound. Four. It's got 24 frets. Hello, Howard. And so, again, when you practice, you practice the vibrato. On 
each individual, uh, using each individual finger. But remember, you always want to think fretboard hand muting. What is your fretboard hand doing to help you be better? And being better means to block out the extra strings that could mess you up. And so once you get, now you see where my thumb is? Now again, I'm almost, I almost have this guitar vertical so you can see. But see it. But you hear the wow and it's in tune it's precise and you don't hear extraneous string noise. Now when you vibrato and bend, remember, hit the note, bend, and vibrato. Now, or you could go, there's two ways. You can bend it up and then vibrato or just, just on your way up, just give it a good shake. But again, see how, I mean, you hear it, it's like, and that's, I'm using my third finger. Now, many times I would use my fourth. But you get, listen to that's a clean sound. Can you imagine with overdrives like, and so that's the idea. You bend, you hit the note, you bend vibrato, or the second part, you hit the note and start to vibrato as you bend. But the goal is multiple are multiple things. You want to bend it upwards so you're in tune, and you want to bend it upwards so your vibrato is expressive, so people feel something from it. And, and when you hear my solo albums from my very first solo album from No Boundaries uh, on to my latest one uh, that I'll talk about, I'll call More Machine Than Man, my vibrato's dead on, but I, I work on it. And even on my album, uh, Hands Without Shadows, I, I use different vibratos to capture in my mind different singers. Like I would think, okay, Ozzy has really no vibrato, very little. David Coverdale, ooh, baby. You know, he's got a really cool one. Uh, so I would try and mimic certain singers' vibratos. And then, you know, everything from Jeff Tate and Bruce Dickinson to the lesser vibrato singers. And, and I mean, like even Freddie Mercury, nothing really matters. He could have gone, nothing really matters. Anyone can see, but he didn't. Why? Because it sounded stupid if he did that. What he did was he had a light, pleasing vibrato. And that's what partly made his amazing voice. Uh, Robert Plant, did you ever hear Robert Plant go, you need cool. Baby, I'm not fooling. No! Why? Because he's Robert Plant and he's cool. But he didn't have that. We are invading the earth. We want you to die. No, it's not like that. It's... So you really have to work on it because this technique is key to your playing. Okay, now I'm going to talk about a couple other things. Um, I've talked about the guitars. This is the Sawtooth M24. It's the first of my signature series. And I've said this in other uh, live streams, but the thing, first of all, Sawtooth is part of a big company. Uh, they are big in themselves, but there's actually three main companies. They are a big, big music company. You know, because, and sometimes at first people are like, would you go to Sawtooth, man? A lot of people hadn't heard of the brand. That's why I, I don't look at something for, oh, what, what, because it, it has a name that I should be part of it. I believe in the company, I believe in the people, and I believe in what they do. I've learned more about manufacturing in, in, since the time I've been with Sawtooth than all the years I was with my previous company. Um, I, I didn't even know uh, some, I just did, you know, I've always had the greatest guitar builders build my guitars. Wayne Charvel, Charvel, the man. Grover Jackson, Jackson Guitars, the man, not the company, the man. And even BC Rich, Bernie Rico, he, he, he was the owner, um, 
I worked through him with Wayne Charvel. I had a BC Rich double guitar that was built by Wayne Charvel. We're talking the man, Charvel. And, and so I've always been associated with some of the greatest guitarists ever. Uh, I mean, greatest guitar makers, luthiers ever. And so sometimes the manufacturing just went right in one ear, ear and out the other because I was dealing with the best. Well, Sawtooth is the best. We are talking screws. We're talking, you know, uh, you know what kind of uh, moisture content in next. It's really incredible to be with this company. And wait till you see what we've already designed that's in the pipeline that's coming out. Okay, because some people say, well, dude, man, you should have, like, graphics again on your guitar. You should have this. Well, why? Been there, done that. These guitars are better than what I did in the past. And, and I can't say enough about the company and the people. But I'm playing a guitar that is literally in the 250 price range. I've never had a signature guitar like that. And they just sound fantastic. So, covered that. I want to cover something else, and then I'm going to talk to you, uh, give you a little story. I have a new record that's, that's being released June 12th. More machine than man. Let's move it over here. Look at this album cover. That is bad. Now check out the vinyl. The vinyl is bad, dude. Okay, here is the inside record cover, black and white. The thank yous, of course. We have a lot of people on there. A lot of people tuned in today have their name on the thank yous of the record. White vinyl. This is just so cool. You know, a lot of people get reds, they get blues. We use white. White is just, it's just really cool. And so I can't say enough about the packaging of this record. There are a total of 13 songs, 13 original songs. Um, you know, because my covers of, of different artists got very famous, you know, people think, oh, well, Michael does uh, covers. That's what he does. But it's not true. Out of all the solo records, which are more than 12, uh, they're 14 right now, um, only two were covers albums. So really, we're looking at less than 10% of my total output of music with all the original music is, is me doing covers. But, I, you know, I can't help what becomes popular. I had a, a version that I did of Randy Rhodes that is so unique, even the Rhodes family loved it. And, and so uh, they, they really, so I cannot predict what's going to be popular with you. But I can tell you this, this new album is amazing. Uh, and then tomorrow we are debuting the title track. The album is called More Machine Than Man. And let me tell you my thought process behind this. The machine part is my technical facility, okay? Because I can play a lot of things and, you know, I'm really accurate. And, and, you know, people that know me know what I can do. But the other part, the man part, um, I, I feel music like, like a lot of other people. And I feel my own music. If I play something that I just like, that gives me a feeling, usually those are all the parts that I keep on records. And, and, I, I, and I've said this before, but just in no boundaries, just, just to go like this. And I played this last night. I'm holding the guitar almost vertical to play this so you can see the neck. But the point is this. That gives me a feeling. And hopefully I've imparted that feeling to you because, you know, I love to play fast. Why not? If you're a Lamborghini and you like to go fast, I feel the need for speed. But I also feel the need for melody. And so I love melody on my new record. I focused on a few things. The rhythm guitar playing is relentless and it's really dry and in your face. And so I would love to see when the record comes out, a lot of people trying to figure out exactly what I did because it's very complex. And then in the, on the top, over the top, I have these great simple melodies over this super complex rhythm. And, and what I did was I didn't layer the heck out of it. You know, you listen to a lot of like quote modern shred records we all know what a DOS system can do, a digital audio workstation. 
Um, you don't have to be a keyboard player to put keyboards down. You don't have to be a bass player to put a bass line down. Um, so many things are intuitive now. It's almost AI with, with music software. But one of the things that I did was, and I love a lot of the new guitar players are, that are out there, I don't want to be like that. I, I want to be Michelangelo Badio. So I said, you know, that's just not my thing. Um, yes, can I layer it? For sure. But I didn't so you could hear the nuances of how intricate the rhythm guitars are, how sparse the lead guitars, the guitars are over the top, and how musical it all works together. Then you add Chris Adler. Oh my God. The new video tomorrow is the title track from the record, More Machine Than Man. Now let me give you a little background about this. There's a slightly well-known producer named Josh Wilbur who produced Megadeth's last album. And uh, he won a Grammy for it. Uh, he's produced Trivium. He did all the Lamb of God. Not everything, but a lot of the later Lamb of God things. He is a Grammy award-winning producer. He arranged the song. I had all the parts. All he did was take it, and he put it together. And you know what he did? He sped up my original tempo. He's like, Michael, can you do the... I'm like, what do you think? And so I'm, I'm like, yeah, I can do this. And so... He, he, he arranged the whole thing. So we have a Grammy award-winning producer arranging this song. And it was all parts that I wrote. I had them in different orders in this particular song. And so, and he put it together and made it absolutely amazing. And it's one of the longest cuts on the record. See, he, he's not worried about time or, oh, it's got to be in the four minutes. He's worried about how it feels, how it flows. This song is mean. It's super progged out. And then... He produced Chris Adler's drums, so he recorded Chris and produced the drum tracks. Chris is one of my favorite drummers of all time, and it doesn't hurt that he looks very similar to Brad Pitt, so he's a cool-looking dude, but he's a great guy to work with. You know, we're, we're, we're friends, and, and he just played amazing. What I tried to do on the record, especially with the songs that Chris played on, are leave it open so you can hear the nuances of what a drummer that's as good as Chris Adler can do. I mean, when you hear these little things, I mean, he's, the guy's got 99 cymbals. I'm kidding, I don't know how many. It, was, um, it took over a day just to set up the drum kit in the studio. So the song is called More Machine Than Man. The tempo was actually sped up from Josh Wilbur. Then Chris and I recorded our parts. Adler played fantastic. And we left his drum sound. When you hear the drum sound on the record, it's very natural. It's not overly compressed. And, and we, we wanted to make it so you really understand what my rhythm guitars are doing, what the bass is doing. We have a loud bass on the record. I played a lot of it uh, because it's so intricate. I just would rather play it myself than try to teach somebody else. And then Victor Wooten did a, a guest bass solo on the song AVTD, which is a really cool song. Um, and so anyway, we are debuting worldwide the premiere of the title track from the record, More Machine Than Man. Uh, we are debuting the video tomorrow at around 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Time, 12 p.m. Uh, Chicago Time, 6 p.m. UK Time, 7 p.m. Germany and Italy Time. And if you're in Beijing, you're 12 hours later than Chicago, so you're going to be at 12 o'clock midnight. How do I know this stuff? I've been to 58 countries! I know a little bit about time zones. Nothing. Jet lag? What is jet lag? I'm in a constant state of jet lag. I'm in a perpetual, even during, you know what, with this coronavirus, thank God I've got a cool house and, and, and I, I'm enjoying staying home, but I actually lost track of the days. I'm like, what day is it today? And I didn't look at my phone. My phone was off and I needed to update it. If you guys didn't update the latest the thing, my phone was getting really, it wouldn't turn out. I'm like, now there's calendars all over my house. But did I think of looking at a calendar? No, I can invent two guitars, but I didn't think of looking at a calendar. I'm like, what day is it? It's like Sunday or Monday. It's like, feel lucky, punk. I'm in a Clint Eastwood zone tonight. Do you feel lucky? And so, and then I turn on my phone. You mean it's Monday? It's not Sunday? I lost a day. Oh my God. I was supposed to practice this stuff on Sunday. And so, but anyway, uh, I just find that when, you know, I'm dealing with this caliber of musician, uh, like a Chris Adler or working with a person like Josh Wilbur, you know, they bring so many things to the table. And if, and if you want to know anything about the, the Mikey version of life, I am not a lone wolf. 
I might play solo concerts, but I have companies behind me. I have people behind me. I'm with a company called Sawtooth, and I said they're a big company. They have Sawtooth guitars. I'm the main endorsee. Sawtooth basses. Rudy Sarzo is the main endorsee. Sawtooth drums. A fairly known, well-known drummer, Vinny Apice. If you heard every cool Dio song that's ever been a hit, I, Vinny was the drummer. He was also Black Sabbath's drummer on Heaven and Hell. And his first gig was a fairly well-known guy named John Lennon. And so we're talking an ex-Beatle. He thought enough of Sawtooth drums to, to be the main drum and Dorsey. These instruments are fantastic. And don't let the price point fool you. It's, I've said it, but I'm gonna say it again. It's easy to make a $10,000 guitar. You know how? You hire a luthier and pay him 10 grand and he makes a beautiful guitar for you. That's it. It's easy to do that. If I want my house painted really good, I'm gonna hire a really good painter. There's no difference. It's not hard. Oh yes, we are doing the $9,900 USA guitar. Boy, that's really tough, man. It's like, whoa, bro. Like, I bet you had to outsource that. You better, you had to source that out, bro. It's not hard. It's hard to do what Sawtooth does. To put a German-made Floyd Rose, the top of the line, the best in the planet, on a $400 guitar. Try that one. And so that is the moral of my story. Now, I've talked about the record. I want to talk about a friend of mine. Hopefully you're listening. His name is Al Bain. Now, you've heard Hell Bent, Hell Bent for Leather. Well, Al Bain is Al Bain for Leather. So we used to, of course, and, and Al is a really good friend of mine. I've known him since my time when I lived in California. But Al Bain, Al Bain for Leather. He's, he is the master at making stage clothes, uh, leather, uh, guitar straps, really beautiful. Well, he made this thing. It's pretty cool. It goes around your guitar strap, and it's really high-quality leather. And inside holds a whole bunch of guitar picks. And so you can actually use these as spare picks when you have them on your guitar strap. So it's a really cool thing. Uh, if you're interested, Al is a great person. We've been friends for a very long time. Uh, he's in California, in Southern California, around the LA, in LA. And it's Al Bain, A-L-B-A-N-E. Al Bain for leather. And the best way to remember it is the Judas Priest song, Al Bain, Al Bain for leather. I mean, he's really amazing. Okay, now, I've talked about the lesson extensively. I've talked about the bends. I've talked about this. I'm going to tell you a story. Because especially in the 21st century, and I'm going to put a little overdrive in this bad boy. I am using a 25-watt sawtooth amp. <laughs> just got a, such a killer tone. I love it. Now I'm going to flip to the overdrive circuit. Now I'm going to switch back to my other guitar. That is the white M24. I was playing the black one for all this time uh, since the beginning. Hang on one second. Okay. I'm going to talk about the MAB over under technique. Now, what I have known since day one is that, I'm plugging this in here, hang on one second, is that from the time a, a person could beat on a log and create a beat, boom, 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 there was a guy like Tommy Lee who looked way cooler hitting that spinning sticks twirling upside down. There is something to be said for stage presence. Even a lack of, you know, during the heyday of the 80s, the L.A. hair metal scene, there's Metallica. And we used to say back then Metallica had no image because they just wore jeans and T-shirts. They didn't get all their custom clothes and, you know, their hair done up like, like I did and everybody else did in that era. And so... Now, let me show you something that I developed. I am left-handed, and I've always had a knack for doing stage things. I, I was flamboyant on stage from the time I picked up a guitar. When I was uh, a teenager, we were 18 years old, 19 and 20. I was on a really popular cover band called Episode. And we had a great lead singer named Mark Baker. 
Uh, Doug Orlando, the keyboard player, was fantastic. Uh, we had two different bass players and two different drummers, but our original drummer was a, a, a lifelong friend of mine named Dan Van Schindel, who can play Rush. He's, you know, we were all very progressive-minded. We were all trained musicians. We, we all listened to very similar, more complex music. It would be like the dream theaters of our day. And so we had a very skilled group, and our original bass player was named Jim Tannery. Then we got another bass player named Tony Noah who was a much better bass player. I mean, he could slap bass. He was in the Earth, Wind, and Fire. I mean, we, we were doing Shine and Star and then Roundabout by Yes. We were really, we would do like Jethro Tull, and then we would play The Who. We would do Led Zeppelin, and then we would do some of my songs, you know, like... <laughs> I had a song called I Wish I Could Do It Again. Very proggy. But anyway, when we were playing Roundabout, the Yes song, it's 10 minutes long! And I had to do this. I had to play this part. It drove me crazy. Like, la, 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 la. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I love Yes, but boring. Boring, 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 boring. I hated playing this. I hated that song. Not that I didn't like the song. I hated playing it because it was just so long. And it's all these vocals and all these parts. And it was the last song of our set. So I started doing some stuff. I... Now, being that it was the last song of our set, we did a minimum of 445s or sometimes 540s. That was the era that I grew up in. That's what you did. Uh, there were rock clubs everywhere. We used to play all the time, but it was either four 45-minute sets or five 40-minute sets. That's what we did all the time. And Roundabout was at the end. I think it was the first set. I can't remember that. I'd have to look. But it was at the last song of the set, for sure, 100%. So anyway, I get off stage, and people are like, dude, man, that was like, what's that thing that, like, you do, man? I'm like, what thing, man? It's like, you know, it's like over thing, like you're playing the piano, bro. I'm like, you like that, huh? And see, I'm left-handed. And I said, okay, cool. So I started to expound upon it. Now, when I was a sophomore in high school, when I was 16, I got to watch Second row with one of my friends. I wasn't even old enough to drive. I was old enough to drive, but I didn't have my license yet. And, and so my friend that was 17 drove us, uh, me, just me and him. We had second row to see Deep Purple, the original Deep Purple. And I watched Richie Blackmore go. So people ask me all the time, can you play smoke on the water? Yes. Notice how in tune it is. I love this guitar. So anyway, I watched Rick, Richie Back, Blackmore play, and he played over the neck, but he did not actually play. He didn't go. Not at all. All he did was this. He went like. He was very over. The word I use is overt. He was very overt. He's doing this, very flamboyant. And I said to myself, that's what I'm missing. I am missing the flamboyance, the overt playing, like with these grand hand gestures. And see, Blackmore was great at that. He was the master. Plus, he wrote. You know, people kid around and say, hey, you, can you play Smoke on the Water? I never played Smoke on the Water in my life in a band. Never, when I was younger, we would play Highway Star, Strange Kind of Woman. Uh, we would play the harder songs. We never played Smoke on the Water. But I'm telling you, a hundred years from now, that riff's still going to be cool. So when people say, can you play Smoke on the Water, dude? You think you're funny. But Richie Blackmore is worth a lot of money because he is that creative and wrote that riff. That riff's brilliant. I don't care what anybody says. That riff is the, one of the catchiest riffs in the history of music. Try writing one of those. So yeah, can I play Smoke on the Water? Proudly! Yes! Yes! And 
And the fact they mention Frank Zappa in the song, who's a genius beyond genius, he's up there with Beethoven and Mozart, in my humble opinion. I love Zappa. You mention Zappa in a song called Smoke on the Water. That's four stars, four metal stars for me. Two plus two is metal four. Now, here's what happened. With this over under, once I saw Blackmore, I said, man, I can do this. And then I started realizing open strings are the key. I invented this over under technique. <laughs> Now, I want to keep my face in the picture. I would bring the camera down so you could see it. I'm literally playing vertically. And so sometimes um, take this into account when I'm playing because normally I would have it, my guitar down here. But I want to show you and I want to keep my face in the camera. So when I'm doing this, I use my thumb to pivot. And I am actually showed this in my very first instructional program. I showed this in the 80s. Nobody could do it. Richie Blackmore didn't do it. This is my invention. It took two decades till the 21st century. Now people include it, uh, you know, parodies of guitar included. Ingve plays it. Iron Maiden plays it. Uh, but it started from somewhere and it started from me. And let me tell you what I did. I started realizing open strings are my friend. <laughs> I started playing more flip. I started really going for it. And the more flamboyant, the more overt I got with this, the more people were like, dude, man, I ain't never seen nothing like that, man. It's like, it was mind blowing. I mean, picture everybody else standing there like, logs, cut down logs doing their was, and here's me, Wah! it's my idea of a wah, Wah! and so what I start, people were like, oh my god, I've never seen anything like this, it blew LA away, nobody had this before, I had something, and then add my double guitar, I had, I had weapons, in, in the holster that nobody had at the time, and I'm not saying this to be cooler, to be better, this is my thought. I worked this. This is not something that happened overnight. I had worked on this technique for years, but then came Gary Moore. <laughs> Gary Moore released a, an album in the early 80s called Corridors of Power. See, everybody thinks of Gary Moore as this blues player. The dude was in Thin Lizzy. He was metal! But he had Don't Take Me For a Loser. I love that song. But he had this solo called End of the World. And I thought, that is metal! And here's me, you know, I'm a 20 something guy going, end of the world. Oh. And so I said to myself, Gary, I'm going to own that riff. I heard this riff. <laughs> heard that riff and I said, you know why I liked it? Because I love using wang bars, but like, <laughs> I, you know, I use it occasionally for the squeals, kind of like dying, but I'm not a big wang bar fanatic. And now a lot of times, uh, younger guitar players put their trem bar like this, which is kind of cool because <laughs> really cool thing. I mean, I think they do it to be different than the generation before them, but it, it's a very expressive way to do it. I mean, I've done this a lot of times. Wait, wait, I, I'll show you. Let's get it up. It's very cool. Uh, you know, I still like it here because I think I can grab it easier and I can do more with it on this position. Look at Steve I, how amazing he is with it. So anyway, Kerry Moore didn't use a wang bar. And I was Mr. Floyd Rose. And so he did not use a trem at all. And all he did was blistering lick. And I said, Gary, you can run, you can hide, but I will own you. I will own that riff. And I used to sit there and I would hear this. And I loved it because it sounded like in my ear, I mean, I had ear train. I knew it was in one scale. It was the, you know, E natural minor Aeolian mode. And I said, Gary, you can run. You can hide. You can do what you want. 
I will find you. I will own this riff. I will make it mine. And so I started listening over and over and over to this riff. So I would, I would like, you know, do, come home from whatever I was doing and I'd put on the cassette and I would wind up the cassette to that part. It would like take 10 minutes just to get to a 30 second part. And so I started listening. I'm like, and I would listen. I'm going, Gary, Gary, Gary. Gary, and I knew he was using opening strings, open strings, but I had no idea of the exact way he did it, and I wanted to learn exactly the way he did it. There was no tab that I could read. Uh, there, was, there was no slowing it down. Uh, I had a cassette. That's it. It just played in, in real time. And so I'm listening. I'm going, Gary, 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 I own you. <laughs> I hate you, but I love you. I hate you, but I love you, Gary. I love you, Gary, but I hate you because I can't figure out this part. So I'm sitting there going, what? What? Ah! Gary Moore, I hate you, but I love you, Gary. I love you. You're, you're very meaningful to me. And so I would sit there going back and forth day after day. I, I was listening. And I'm like, ah! I can't get it. Now, I know an E natural minor. I've known it since I was 14 years old. So I know the scale. I know it's, um, you know, the Aeolian mode or the natural minor scale. Same difference. I know this. I've known it my whole life. And so I couldn't figure out the strings he used. And then one day, I'm sitting there, I'm like, I have you now, Gary. And I'm like, Gary, Gary. Like the Ewoks. Gary, Gary, Gary. Gary. I couldn't figure it out! And I played ah! I hate you, Gary! But I love you. I love you, Gary. I, it's a very emotional experience. And so this went on and on, literally, for like weeks. And finally, uh, m a month plus later, I was, I was doing something and it popped in my head. The epiphany, the musical epiphany. And I said, Gary. I own you now. And I, went, I mean, listen how cool that is. One scale, six strings, all open strings. And I said, Gary, I've got you now. I own you, bro. Here's what I said. It's one thing to steal. It's another thing to steal and make it your own. So I said, if Gary Moore could do this. <laughs> Michelangelo Badio took Gary Moore's riff and did this. I hope I can do it with my guitar. Look, let me move the camera now. That's what I did. And if so, if you get anything out of this workshop and this live stream today, steal. But that doesn't mean you just steal. You know, that that's being slash in a tribute band. You take from other people and make it your own. Do I love Gary Moore? Yes, but I hate him. But I love you, Gary. I love you, Gary. And then when he wrote things like uh you know, when he started his blues thing and his voice, like, you know, even in Corridors of Power, he had an amazing voice. And, and, and so, he, you know, he had the whole package. And, and uh, but I t took from other people and I extrapolated what they did. And so when I started doing the over-under, I, I based, if I'm in the key of E, I based it off Gary Moore. And I based it off that riff. And I'm telling you, it blew minds. I mean, when you, especially when you watch my earlier videos, here is the historical context. I was the only guy on planet Earth doing it. I mean, that's, that's the historical context. You know, now it's funny because I see opening acts and everybody does this. Well, it's kind of like saying, well, you know, like watching uh, somebody use a double neck and playing Led Zeppelin. And I'm not equating myself with them at all, but I was, I tried to be an innovator, not an emulator. And, you know, it's easy to be slashing a Guns N' Roses tribute band. It's easy to be... Uh, anybody 
uh, if you copy that artist. Well, yes, I copied artists like every other great artist did, but I made what I learned from them my own. And I showed this in my very first instructional program. This is the first time it was ever, I have the very first shred video that has ever been released before Paul Gilbert, Tony McAl McAlpine. And again, I'm not saying I'm better than Cooler. I'm putting it in historical context for you because um, one of the things, you know, I think about too is my legacy. You know, I've been, a, I, I'm still here all these years later at a high level playing for you. And it's because of the way my methodology and teaching, I take my own advice. I don't say, it's not do as I say, not as I do. You know, it's like, you know, you hear on the news, all these people from these news outlets, wear your mask, mask shamming. And then, and, and then they're not wearing it. You know, it's like, well, uh, let me see. You know, it's, it's like people telling you, do this on guitar. Well, okay, well, you don't do it. It doesn't matter. This is what I do. You listen to me and only me. I am the Lord of the six and seven and eight strings. So, okay, I don't particularly subscribe to that theory. My teaching is very simple. I, I show you the information, you do what you want with it. But when it came to me doing uh, this over under technique, um, I'm, we are going to post on my YouTube channel a lot of these classic videos so you get to see the first instructional program and they are all available through Metal Method. Now I'm gonna close it off here with saying that I, I just want you to know I sincerely appreciate the love that I've been getting back. I mean, we've had great numbers and I have sincerely, my entire musical career, I've tried to help other guitar players. And I have to say, I wanna pat myself on the back a little bit uh, because Look at this newest generation of players. They are so great. And I can't help but think, if I stand by 99.999% of everything I ever said, because my methodology was correct then, it's correct today, and it will be correct tomorrow. And so, and it was meant to help you. Wait, there we go, you. Okay, uh, and so, I want to say this, Sawtooth rules. They make fantastic amps, fantastic guitars. My new album, More Machine Than Man, on Rat Pack Records, the video, the new video featuring Chris Adler on drums, More Machine Than Man, the title track, will debut tomorrow around 1 p.m. New York time, you know, East Coast time. Uh, I want to say that we've talked, I talked extensively about the lesson, almost half the amount of time. And then uh, I talked about the MAB over under, and I will be back next week. And we also are going to, a uh, few weeks from now, do another workshop where I play electric guitar and acoustic and add the ukulele. And also, I'm going to be on tour. We're, we're, we're really counting on this. It's, um, I'm going to be in Europe for five weeks starting November 10th. We're going to start in Italy. Then we're going, you know, into Austria, you know, hopefully Germany. Uh, we're going to the Czech Republic, you know, Slovenia, Slovakia. I've been to all these countries before, but we're going to do an extensive tour of Europe for five weeks. And before that, I'm going to be in the United States. Um, and I, I, we're just hoping. But I, I, we have a great VIP masterclass uh, before the show. And, and uh, I can help you. You know, Speed Kills works. MAB can help you be a better guitar player. If you're a beginner, I can help you move forward. If you're intermediate, I can help you move forward. If you're advanced, I can point out things that validate what you do and that also what you need to look at so that when you even try more advanced things that you get to that level or instead of hurting yourself. But anyway, on behalf of, Saw, on behalf of Sawtooth Amps, Sawtooth guitars, sawtooth basses, sawtooth drums, and chromacast music products. I'm Michelangelo Badio. See ya!